Hello, everyone. My name is Lucian. Most of you know me from Twitter as Triangle Investor. In today's edition of CEO and Market Expert interviews, we will cover Leading Edge Materials Corporation, a company that is developing a portfolio of projects in European Union with the vision to supply sustainable and secure uh, sources of critical raw materials to European industrial ecosystems. I'm joined by their CEO, Mr. Eric Kraft. Uh, Eric, thank you for coming to my show. It is great to have you. Hi, thank you for inviting me. Very nice to meet you. You too. Uh, Eric, uh, you are for the first time uh, in my guest, so I will ask you to share us your background and some specifics of how did you end up in resource and uh, exploration sector? Yeah, thanks. So uh, I'm Swedish. Uh, I, I left Sweden when I started working and I've been uh, uh, working around the world. And um, uh, 20 years ago, I was uh, working in, in China. I was running a small dry bulk shipping business. So another uh, segment of natural resources. I was transporting coal and iron ore. And uh, uh, of course, 20 years ago, that was the beginning of or the middle of the what we now call the commodity super cycle. It was an absolutely brilliant period to be there in that business and, and really since then I've been involved in natural resources and energy and different facets of, of, uh, of that ever since. Um, and I really don't want to do anything else. <laughs> Excellent. When did you come uh, on board of Leading Edge? Uh, I, I got involved in uh, Leading Edge materials about three and a half years ago uh, and uh, I, I uh, identify the company as as uh, having great assets that that uh, I thought I, I could uh, uh, develop and and so uh, uh, I became the company's largest shareholder and and uh, uh, joined the board and and so on in, in 2020. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Excellent, Eric. Uh, before we talk about company projects and news, I would like to touch on the critical raw materials that are determined by the European Union based on their economic importance and supply risk. Uh, can you tell us, please, what are the most important ones or which are in the biggest supply risk? And uh, what is the uh, European Union doing at the moment to help the developers, such as yourself, uh, to bring projects online? Yeah, so uh, in Brussels, they have created a list of, of different uh, uh, metals and materials that they consider critical. So, th so those are uh, what we need to mm -hmm. sustain the way of life that we want and, and balancing that with uh, how does the supply situation look. So, for example, a lot of these come from, from Asia. Uh, and Asia is far away and it's a different country. So then uh, it's... Uh, they perceive it as a risk and something that we ought to have more control of uh, here within the union. Uh, so it is uh, battery metals and all the green transition uh, materials, but, but it's also, for example, phosphate rock, which of course we need as a fertilizer to feed 8 billion people. And, and uh, uh, so to help stimulate more of this uh, at home in here in, in the European Union, uh, they have proposed a piece of legislation called the Critical Raw Materials Act uh, that uh, su uh, proposal suggests that, that uh, uh, of the materials that we consume here in Europe, we, we should have, uh, we should be uh, mining and producing at least 10% uh, uh, of it uh, domestically and, and more of it that should be processed and refined and there's conditions on recycling and other things. So, but it's quite a potent piece of legislation because since we are we are producing almost none of it today, and you know how long it takes to build a mine. I mean, five years is is nothing. Uh, and this they want done by 2030. And uh, of course, in Europe we have great geology in in many places and and. Uh, uh, what's been difficult in Europe has been permitting. So they they propose that that all the member states have to uh, adhere to maximum two year permitting process for projects that are deemed 
strategic. So that, of course, is very encouraging for, for uh, people like myself. Yeah, but some people would argue that the European Union is too, bureau- too much bureau- uh, bureaucracy. Would you agree on that? I, I think it's always easy to, to blame politicians, you know, that they are not doing enough or they're doing yeah. the wrong thing. And so on. I, I don't think it's easy to be a politician. I, I think uh, uh, what they have proposed and, and what I see is that uh, and everyone that I speak to in Stockholm or in Brussels, they really understand that we are in an emergency. And it, it's not just about climate change. Climate change is popular to, to talk about and it stim- you know, stimulates interest from young people and so on. But it, it, it's really about more than that. It's about geopolitical security. We saw what happened. Uh, Germany put yeah. itself in a position of complete dependence on Russia for natural gas and you know, that didn't work out good. We are largely in the same position of dependence on, on China with a lot of other things. So this, they don't, they don't want to repeat that. Uh, there's also the question of <clears throat> European jobs and tax revenues, technology. And when you start to see uh, great cars that have been made in China and they are sold in Europe at a terrific price point, that, that's a threat on German industry, French industry and so on. So I, I think, and politicians really understand this. So so I, I think what they are doing is is uh, pretty impressive and pretty good. And, and it is really heavy lifting. So uh, 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 I can't complain. And also, I think that what they propose from Europe, you, you know, there are similar initiatives in, in the US and other places, but yeah. Uh, I, I'm not such a big fan of, of subsidies um, and so it's better to have uh, politicians draw up rules and then yeah. private companies have to figure out the way uh, to uh, to make it work and be profitable. And, and I think it's good what they have done, uh, what, what is proposed, because that will really stimulate growth in, in the right places without yeah. subsidies. Yeah, agreed. Uh, you touched on China. A few days ago, we saw the news where China has imposed export controls on graphite. And uh, it was said that the Beijing hits back at US-led restrictions on technology sales to Chinese companies. Uh, how big is this news for graphite supply and demand equation? Yeah, so uh, we have, uh, maybe we'll talk about that later, but we have, uh, we own a graphite mine in Sweden, and it's actually the only one which is built and permitted in the European Union. That graphite mine has been kept it on current maintenance since 2015, because graphite prices have been low. It's been low because uh, uh, mostly in China, they have uh, started producing graphite at really big scale, and uh, and, and selling it at low prices that has really outcompeted competed uh, producers in Europe and America. And, and uh, so I, the, the piece of news that you mentioned, I, I mean, I, I don't know exactly what it means and, you know, we will have to see, but for sure it's, it's another reminder of the power of China say, uh, saying that, uh, uh, you know, uh, it, they can put some restrictions in place and, and you know, that, that would really hamper our green transition and, and all of this that, that we try to propose. Again, I think it's better that there's no reason why Europe cannot build its own supply chains. We have the geology, we have the technology and the know-how. There's been a lack of will yeah. in the last 30 years because of uh, a lot of... Uh, room has been given to environmental group, naturalist groups who don't want uh, mining. But uh, but I, I think that is, is changing a little bit. And, and if we want to be prosperous and if we want to have a green transition, it's better that we, we uh, do what we can ourselves. It's not really fair to say that everything that's a little bit difficult or where there is some opposition in Europe, oh, we outsource that to someone else. They can do it in Africa or in Asia. I don't think that's good policy. Yeah, I hope uh, that as well, since I'm in Europe also. Uh, Eric, let's discuss your project. Uh, you have mentioned you have a graphite mining and plant in central Sweden, Boxnack. 
uh, it is called Voxna. It is advanced project that has uh, NI43101 resource and the PEA. Please give us an overview of this project, current status and plans for going forward. Yeah, thanks. So it, it is a, a mine that has been uh, operating and, and producing graphite concentrate. And, and as I mentioned, uh, it's been on current maintenance since uh, graphite prices have uh, really been too low to, to justify uh, uh, running it. I think um, uh, w during that time, we, we, have we have developed a, a downstream uh, battery anode material business plan that, that you referred to in, in, in the PEA that we published yeah. in 2021. Uh, so, of course, that is very interesting. That would be, then we would be producing a, a much higher value product than graphite concentrate. But, of course, it comes with uh, quite large capex needed. There is technical risk, and, and you know, it, it, it's not so easy. Uh, and uh, what we have stated is what we would like to see. The first step would be to produce graphite concentrate in Sweden. And, and in order to, to do that, we, because it's built and permitted the mine, we can restart production quickly and with very low capex. Uh, and, but, but we would like to see prices a bit higher to, to, to justify that. Maybe now with a piece of news coming out of China, and, and you know, maybe that will stimulate uh, more interest for graphite that is sourced uh, outside of those Chinese supply chains. And, and uh, the, when when that news came out last week, uh, I, me, like many other graphite producers, I, of course, have NDAs with almost all of the big OEMs, and they all reached out last Friday to, to talk. So yeah, that, that's, of course, encouraging. Yeah, yeah. Can you expand a little bit on the PEA numbers? What are they telling us? So to say, yeah. So so they, they um, basically, if, if if you if you produce uh, uh, graphite concentrate, that's one value. If you do these <clears throat> uh, steps to to um, create a higher value product, uh, the, the steps are you you have to shape the particles, you have to purify them. Mm -hmm. And and lastly, you need to put the coating. Then you create what is called active anode material. So the PEA really explains uh, that mm -hmm. and and provides them a, 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 a around quarter of a billion dollar MPD for for that project. So it is an interesting uh, project. I mean, the economics are really good. Yeah, uh, uh, but yeah, no, obviously not not without its technical challenges. You have to remember that, um, uh, uh, particularly the Chinese, but also the Korean and the Japanese, they've been doing this for a long time, and they're really good at it. Uh, we're not going to catch up with them in, in you know very quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Eric, let's switch to your second project, and that is Nora Car Heavy Rare Earth Deposit, uh, also in Sweden. Uh, same question: overview of this project, current status, and plans for going forward. Yeah, so Nora Char is is a, a globally significant, uh, absolute tier one uh, uh, deposit. It was discovered uh, over a hundred years ago. Uh, <clears throat> it's in in central Sweden. Uh, it is. Uh, uh, particularly rich in in uh, the two heavy rare earth elements, dysprosium and terbium, which are critical when you make permanent magnets. So permanent magnets, as you know, are used in in, for example, in uh, electric motors for electric vehicles and and wind turbines. And uh, this uh, uh, business is really old almost 100% controlled by China today. They, ha they have been investing um, uh, for a long time into this and, and they have a, uh, they're really way ahead of, of everyone else. Uh, so uh, now there is uh, big efforts underway 
to develop a magnet industry in Europe and in America. Uh, and um, so, like we said, we don't want to be dependent on, on, on China for something as important as, as uh, magnets. So, uh, Nora Scher uh, is really the only game in town in, in Europe to, uh, to make Europe uh, self-sufficient in those uh, heavy rare earth elements. And, and uh, so we, we looked at that and that is, oh, sorry. No problem. Uh, phone call. Uh, and uh, that is reflected in a, in a PA uh, published a couple of years ago that, that returns an NPV of, of uh, around three quarters of a billion dollars, $200 million EBITDA and, and uh, so the, the economics of that project are really, really robust. It's always been a question of permitting. And that's in fact what I spend uh, most of my time on now. And, and uh, yeah, we are doing really good uh, progress on that. And we feel very hopeful that, that we, we will be able to get it across the finish line. What we did when I got him on the company, the first thing was to redesign that project with a view to giving it maximum chances to to succeed to get permitted in Sweden. And, and that new project design, along with the fact that how much sentiment has changed now, as we talked about before, uh, really gives us a uh, lot of optimism uh, for that. And it's a great, you know, it's a huge asset, huge resource, and really uh, has the chance to really make a difference, you know, make Europe self-sufficient for a very long time with these uh, critical metals. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Eric, let's say in ideal circumstances, uh, when could this project be in the in production? Well, I, I think what we've uh, said is that uh, we are doing a Natura 2000 permit application right now. Uh, we are also starting a mining lease application. Uh, and um, so you, we need to do that. Then we need to do a, a, a PFS. DFS on the new project, and lastly, in in Sweden, you you uh, you get the environmental approval uh, from a court. So there are a few steps to do here, uh, and uh, 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 of course, what would be extremely encouraging would be if the Critical Raw Materials Act that we talked about, if that indeed would would uh, uh, come into legislation. Uh, I think. You, you would be hard pressed to find a project in the European Union that more ticks more of the critical strategic project boxes than Nora Scher. So that, that would really be a red carpet candidate for this two year permitting. But but um, who knows? We we work along on, on the on the on the path right now. Okay, before we move to your third project, uh, I would like to ask you about doing business in Sweden. I mean, particularly doing business in Swedish uh, mining and exploration industry. How is the current government uh, looking on mining? But I think in general, doing business in Sweden is great. Uh, Sweden is, uh, you know, there's no corruption. The legal yeah. system works. Uh, you, uh, it, it, it's everyone likes to complain, but it's a pretty well-functioning country, and, and uh, uh, it's good. And you know, as we talked about, it has been tough with uh, certain groups that have been given a lot of voice that have been, you know, really mm -hmm. against mining and against nuclear and against any type of project that involves doing something in nature. But but that's really changing now. So uh, it's amazing how much sentiment has shifted. And I think it, it, it started a little bit during COVID when we were exposed to how extremely dependent we are on supply chains from Asia yeah. and you know when those got a little bit disrupted then, then uh, you know people were worried we we're running out of toilet paper and you know all this yeah. stuff which yeah. I think was a good wake-up call yes and then of course with the uh, you know the terrible atrocities Russia's invasion of of Ukraine uh, and people start to connect the dots saying that ah you know uh, maybe if Germany and other countries would have not 
been so dependent on Russian gas, Putin maybe would have not had the balls to do something so so drastic. And, and you know, the old American expression, fences make good neighbors, maybe it's quite good. You know, we can prosper more together if we respect each other. And, and, and you know, it, it's not much of a partnership when someone is too dependent on someone else. Yeah, agreed. So this, this uh, you know, uh, the current government in Sweden, I think, is uh, has been very encouraging and... and uh, 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 green transition, of course, is a global challenge in every country. That you know, everyone realizes that. Also in China, and you, you know, it affects all of us, and everyone takes it seriously. I think in some countries, it is uh, it's a challenge, but it's also a huge opportunity. Scandinavia is one of those places uh, where we have uh, geology and technology, and, and it actually could be really, really beneficial for us locally as, as well as for Europe. So uh, and I, I see that politicians don't want to squander that opportunity. Yeah. Uh, Eric, let's move to your Romania nickel cobalt project. Uh, you, you have just announced yesterday receiving high-grade cobalt nickel result, results from uh, sampling uh, at, this, at this project. Uh, how would you interpret uh, these results? Tell us more. Yeah, it's really uh, extremely exciting. Thing and, and very opportune that uh, you and I have doing this interview today. You were the first one I, I speak to about the results from yesterday. So exclusive. Okay. Oh, oh, you bet. So uh, and and um, I think as far as exploration projects go for these battery <laughs> metals, I, I, it's in my opinion for sure the best project in certainly in in, in Europe. And so. Um, we uh, on the license there is uh, an old uh, uranium mine actually that was mined out and shut thirty years ago, uh, mm -hmm. but the area has been really well explored, uh, going starting in the nineteen fifties, and uh, they have explored it by uh, driving these galleries tunnels through the mountain, and we have uh, hundreds of kilometers of of these tunnels, so. We gained access to to enter those and and uh, uh, earlier this year, and uh, so because we have that uh, and and some of these tunnels, you you see visible mineralization with your eyes, and and uh, uh, so of course that that's super exciting. So so we've been uh, sampling, doing that, and trying to understand uh, the geology, and. The results that we announced yesterday are are extremely encouraging, and so we have uh, 180 uh, uh, chip line uh, samples, and and it's from two of these different galleries that are on different levels, and uh, you will see in uh, from that that uh, the the grades are are really high, uh, so uh, there is two different geological occurrences, two different types of mineralization. So one is uh, 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 nickel, cobalt, gold, and one is uh, 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 lead, zinc, uh, copper, silver. And uh, what you will see there from, from uh, the, these uh, uh, chip samples, they are over really large distances. So it's high grades, but it's also over big distances of course we have more work to do on this but but it, you know it, it's not that we've taken 180 samples from the same rock that, that's always my thinking when i read junior mining press release okay uh, but um so i think what it demonstrates is the the scale of of this system and of course the grades that uh, uh that are good so I, I mean as far as exploration projects go uh, there's uh, uh, nothing that excites me more, more than that. Mm -hmm. So next steps on that now is we, we need to do more, uh, a few more rounds of, of, of chip samples because there are some other hot zones that we need to check and, and then uh, channel sampling and, and then we, we will be doing uh, drilling from underground inside these galleries uh, uh, during the winter. And that that would really be to determine the sort of tonnage and and, and volumes that that we feel we have there. So, 
Yeah, so this additional work will be done, like you said, this winter, right? Well, the, the, the drilling will be done uh, th this winter and, and uh, further sampling is underway right now. So there will be more results uh, coming from that. But as you know, exploration is an iterative process. You, you learn as you go along and you have to, you know, you have an idea, you change your mind. And so uh, now what we've decided is we're going to do underground drilling first. And in the spring, there will be some areas that we will drill from the surface and uh, but it's really, yeah. Yeah. Uh, this project is under joint venture. Who is your partner there and how is the cooperation with your partner? Yeah, it, it's great. We have built a, a terrific team on the ground there and, and a, a very, very uh, amazingly uh, atmosphere and, and result oriented <laughs> uh, people. So yeah, it's a local uh, uh, Romanian uh, partner that is... Uh, part of and supporting us in, in mm -hmm. the project there. Excellent. Uh, I'm, same question like for Sweden, how is doing business in Romania? I, I presume it is a different story. Some other, so to say, maybe problems, but tell us more. How is doing business in Romania in uh, resource uh, in, in resource space? Oh, uh, touch wood. Uh, so I, I think it's great. I, I love working in Romania. I think Romania is really a country where one can get work done. And, and again, in terms of geology, of course, the Romanian history of mining is unbelievable, you know, going back since the, the Romans and everything, you, you know, so yeah. really, really exciting. And, and, uh, and we've had great cooperation from, from all government agencies and people we've dealt with them and it's been uh, of course it's always tough exploration and mining is, is difficult to everywhere do, but, but yeah. everywhere but uh, uh, we, we really feel that it's it's a great place for us to work mm -hmm. excellent uh, Eric are you pursuing more MA in Romania in Europe uh, somewhere else uh, I mean if yes where which projects which commodities would be your interest I think in in leading edge, uh, you know, relative to our size, we we already have three projects that are yes. very big. So so we, we we really focus on on that. Of course, as a as a board, it's always you know sort of chief concern is what how can we unlock or realize shareholder value, and so obviously we're always open to opportunities now we've decided that that you know we, we are advancing these projects uh the, the way we are doing on our own now and um um you know circumstances might change in which case we will reevaluate got it uh let's move to share structure can you tell us a little bit more how many shares do you have outstanding maybe warrants options some rough numbers yeah i think there's about 180 a million shares outstanding. I, I'm the largest shareholder of the company on, on a partially diluted basis. I, I have a bit less than half of, of the company. I'm, I'm uh, uh, interim CEO since since a year. Uh, I don't draw a salary. It's, it's for me. It's really I see the enormous potential to to develop this, and it's really driven driven by that. Second largest shareholder is uh, our uh, chairman, Lars Erik Johansson, who is Swedish. He, he has a long career in mining, running big companies. And lastly, before joining me as chairman here, he, he was the person who built Ivanhoe Mines from uh, one drill hole and four employees to the big company it is today. Uh, so it's it's really us eating our own cooking. Definitely. And uh, who are the other people people besides you two on the board in the management of the company? Yes. So then uh, there is, uh, we are a small board. It's uh, Lars Erik, myself, and then there's Daniel Major, who I know, of course, you know, he's been on your yeah. show before, who, who is a mining engineer and uh, CEO of uh, GobiX Uranium, company where I'm also involved. And, and uh, uh, the three of us, we are really highly involved in uh, in, in this and um, um, think it's a great opportunity and, and a lot of fun to to uh, to work in sure uh eric uh, what about cash position uh, what is the current 
cash position and what are the plans for that amount and when can we expect the future raise of course you are a junior company so raise is a you have to raise the money of course what's your take on this yeah so uh, uh, for now we are okay uh, you know we to do the things that we want to do in Romania and, and in in Sweden it's it's um, uh, we're okay for now obviously <clears throat> wearing my shareholder hat I, I i don't want to get diluted at these levels that i consider uh, uh not reflecting the value of the company so that's i mean that's why i'm speaking to you and, and others to, to try to communicate our point of view uh, the um, i have been supporting the company uh, by exercising warrants uh, and and so we we did uh so in Earlier this year, we did a small capital raise. That was the first capital raise we've done since 2020, which I think is as you, uh, unusual for junior mining companies. We want to really be very careful with with uh, uh, dilution. Yeah, but you participate in that raise, right? Uh, yes. So, uh, I, I, yeah, I did. Uh, I think uh, half or so. So uh, I, I maintain my shareholding. That's conviction. Uh, Eric, uh, I have some questions from my followers, and if you could answer them, it would be great. Uh, I have a list of eight questions. Are you ready? Always. Okay. The first question, are you open for selling Voxna Nora, uh, Nora Car uh, projects? Well, I mean, everything has a price, right? Uh, uh, I, I, I think... Uh, there is more work that we can do to increase the value of those assets. Uh, but, uh, you know, especially I think a project like Nora Share, which for someone who reads the PA will see that it's a really big project. And, and you know, at some point later on, we, we will uh, need someone else to develop that with them. You know, then we'll cross that bridge when we get there. But for the moment, we're, we're uh, happy with the setup we've got. Mm -hmm. Similar question. The second uh, question is similar. How is the interest for the Voxna assets uh, graphite? Yeah, the interest has, uh, as I mentioned, ballooned a lot since this uh, piece of news came out of China last week. So, of course, having the only built and permitted mine, graphite mine in, in Europe, uh, that asset, you know, is valuable. It has scarcity value. And the fact that it can be restarted quickly uh, you know, it is good. So, so uh, that's great, and and uh, hopefully, hopefully that uh, other people will come to that conclusion as well. Okay. Third question: uh, What do you foresee most challenging in the next coming steps for the Romanian project? Uh, I, I mean. Exploration is tough, and it you know it, it's always challenging. But 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 really, I I I feel so excited about this. Um, and if you go back to, you know, uh, when we started looking at that, and you know we had sample drops outside these galleries that had terrific grades and so on, and, and you know we felt encouraged by that. And you always hear people saying, "Oh yeah, but that's just a rock. You, you might have put it there." So you, you know. We we go inside. You we have you see visible mineralization, and you know with the XRF night on you, you can see that you have amazing grades and stuff there. And you you, you know you of course you encounter a lot of skepticism that yeah, it's not as good that, as it looks and so on. We we've always felt that everything that we've done has actually encouraged us that the, our highest hopes for that project remain intact, and everything is on the path. That there, there's no reason for me to doubt that. Uh, what we've got there is uh, a really extraordinary uh, resource and, and something that can and will be mined uh, at the profit. And, and so, you know, yeah, those are ho hopes, I think, of every explorer. But, but uh, every piece of news that we publish, I think, keeps us on that path. So, so of course, always challenges, but, but uh, very gratifying as well. Okay, the next one, in what order would you prioritize uh, your three assets? Well, the, the three assets are, are really different. I, I think in terms of like long-term 
uh, value, uh, a possibility to build and realize long-term value for the company, it is of course uh, to develop Nora Share as a, you know as a the really huge uh, asset it is. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> coming back, looking at the PA that that uh, you mentioned for that project that returns uh, uh, sort of $200 million EBITDA, you know that the companies who are in that space, they don't get valued on mining multiples. They get pretty much tech multiple valuation. So you, you look at you know the, the opportunity to get that permitted to do the right things now is, is uh, huge. So of course, that's very exciting. In, in terms of exploration, what we're doing in Romania, we are, we're really lucky and fortunate to to have that project. And, and uh, uh, I mean, ex exploration is so exciting. And, and you know, uh, is that an opportunity? Of course, huge uh, and a lot of fun. And it's also also important in terms of what it can mean for for uh, uh, Europe. And, and Vox now uh, is a terrific asset as well. I think it's frustrating that we have not managed to put it into production yet. And as I mentioned, that is due to a low global price for, for graphite concentrate. But but uh, of course, we hope, hope that that's going to change and, and, and that, that can be a producing asset soon again. Okay, the next one... Uh... Give me just one second. During which period in time do you project the result of Natura 2000 application? Uh, we, we project to file the application in, in, uh, uh, in, in the spring. So next year, <clears throat> right? But right now there is a proposal to, to change the, uh, the uh, procedure in Sweden <clears throat> to not require Natura 2000 before the mining list application. So they are considering to move this around. So in that case, we would pause the Natura 2000 application and, and directly uh, file the, the mining list application. Mm -hmm. uh, the next one, uh, you are on Govix's board of directors. Uh, can you talk about mm -hmm. what made you join that board and uh, give us an update your thought on uh, recent news that would be interesting. Maybe yeah, so I, I I I know that uh, you like uh, uranium as well, and I, I think uh, no no one likes uranium more than I do. And and I I started investing in uranium back in I think 2017. <clears throat> I, I invested in uh, several companies. GovX was was one of them, and and uh, <clears throat> I joined the GovX board. A few years ago, uh, Govin Friedland is an old friend of mine. We we lived in China at the same time twenty years ago, and and uh, yeah, so I think uh, I, I liked a lot the uh, uh, <clears throat> the vision to to create the sort of most leveraged vehicle to benefit from a rising price in uranium with multiple projects, and and uh, of course now with what's happened in share, that's that's. Um, uh, stirred up a, a big problem. Uh, as a board in that company, we are obviously completely focused on shareholder value, and and uh, Govex has been beaten up a lot. I think Govex is probably the best chance risk uh, investment in 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 the uranium space because of that. We have a second project in Zambia that is almost as advanced as Niger and and. Uh, where the company is, is now, it's it's I think really really attractive. Yeah, I agree one hundred percent. Last question: Name three commodities that you are bullish besides the commodities you have in your company, and name three commodities that you are bearish on. Well, I, I think uh, uh, I, I have to say like, like uranium and copper, I think are terrific commodities and and. Uh, uh, probably also some of these fossil uh, fuels mm -hmm. that that uh, oh. a little bit overlooked. Uh, in terms of bearish, I I, I don't know. I, I think there has been a, a long period of of uh, lack of capex to develop natural resources, and you know 
so much money has gone into salesforce.com and you know computer yeah. games and online casinos and n- n- nothing wrong with that but as we know to to um to have a supply of natural resources it uh, requires constant capex and and really since the gfc that that uh, uh, that lack of investment is going to create a, a tighter supply so i think long all commodities is great uh, Eric, thank you for coming to my show. It was a very good chat. Uh, I look forward to host you again soon after we see more news on your project's development. Uh, Eric, thanks and good luck. Thank you very much. Lot, lots of news coming. So look forward to catch up soon. Definitely. Thank you very much.